Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today is the 19th of July. Today we're going to be talking about Russia's airstrikes. We're also going to be talking about Russia's new offensive activities on the Zvatopi front. Let's begin by talking about Russian strikes, which really occurred in the early morning of the 19th, obviously in Russian and Ukrainian time. So the Russians, they launched a pretty significant round of airstrikes, not just airstrikes, but they also launched strikes with kamikaze drones the Jiran-2 drones, which are the Russian modification of the Iranian kamikaze drone Shahid-136. So most of those drones are probably being launched from the Black Sea. You have the Russian Black Sea fleet with all their vessels, and then there are these launch pads from which the drones are released into the air, and then from there they make their way to different Ukrainian cities. And of course, you also have the Russians launching caliber cruise missiles, again, probably from the Black Sea Fleet or from other Russian Navy vessels that are located in the Caspian Sea. In addition to that, we received reports that earlier in the day of the 19th, there were eight two twenty two strategic bombers that were airborne in the Black Sea area. And so they were most likely launching KH-22 missiles in the direction of Ukraine. And again, they were probably doing that over the airspace of the Black Sea, not over Ukraine itself. In terms of the cities that have been targeted, you have Odessa, but I'm going to focus more on Odessa on a moment. But in terms of the cities that have also been targeted, you have Mykolaiv, you have Zaporozhye, you have Dnipro. You have, in terms of drones that have targeted different cities, there were reports that there were some drone twos that were in the airspace above Poltava, Sumy as well, and Kharkiv. But... In terms of the most extensive damage by far that's being done to the city of Odessa. Now, what's significant about Odessa? Well, Odessa has a very significant port. And that port is where you have all of the Ukrainian grain. And it gets accrued together and it gets shipped through the safe zone. Which was previously agreed upon by the Russians, the Ukrainians and the Turkish. There was a safe corridor for Ukraine to transport grain all the way through the Black Sea and then out of the Black Sea through Turkey and then making its way through the Mediterranean into Africa, but I would say primarily into Europe and then to other countries all around the world. And so this was very important for Ukraine's economy because, you know, obviously they're suffering from significant deficits and from significant destruction to their local industries due to the entire fighting. And so grain is one of the places where Ukraine is the most significant. It's a huge breadbasket. So they rely on these grain exports to make income and to continue the economy during such a difficult time. And so now the Russians, they are targeting Odessa and specifically the Odessa port where you have a lot of these greeneries, you have a lot of these oil depots that are necessary in order to fuel Ukraine's Navy vessels. And so this is more so being done in response to Russia's cancellation of the Green Deal and due to Ukraine's strikes on the Crimean Bridge, obviously. The thing is, Russia has these strikes planned in advance for a very long time, probably months, but they just decided to launch them now due to the circumstances. And so now they're going out targeting Odessa, especially the port of Odessa. That's where we've seen the most strikes being reported by both sides. And it's not just airstrikes, there's a lot of drone strikes which occurred last night and also tonight. There's some webcam footage from different households that live in Odessa which show the impacts, which means that the Ukrainian air defense systems, at least in certain cases, I won't say a specific number because I have no idea, will get numbers from the Ukrainian MOD tomorrow. But again, those are also very unreliable because it's coming from a biased source, but they release information about the number of Russian drones and number of Russian missiles that are launched each time that there's a wave of Russian strikes. You don't have to believe the number intercepted, but I would probably believe the number that is launched because those have been pretty consistent throughout the war. But either way, we're going to see the effect that it has. A lot of the images that are released on social media are blurred, which makes it difficult to get a grasp on the situation on the ground. But it does seem like there has been some significant damage done to the port of Odessa itself, which will make it harder for Ukraine to transport their grain vessels through the Black Sea. And even if the port of Odessa is still in operation and is 
relatively unscathed after these strikes. We don't know whether Russia's going to launch more strikes. Then again, the Russians are now saying that the entire uh, former safe zone, the former safe corridor, is now off limits and that the Russians will now begin to target it again. So it's off limits for you know civilian passage from the Ukrainian side. And so now the Russians, at least in their perspective, are within their rights to begin attacking any sort of Ukrainian target that's going through there, including civilian ships that are shipping grain. And this is again in response to the Crimean Bridge incident, but it also comes as the Russians are complaining about sanctions that are being placed on their food and fertilizer exports. And so the Russians are saying that they may be willing to reconsider their termination of the Green Deal if the global sanctions on their food and fertilizer are eased. So that's another potential reason for Russia's cancellation. So Odessa, in terms of its significance, Odessa, as I said before, has ports. Odessa does have some military barracks, but I don't think that was the main reason why it was targeted. There's also some electric substations, obviously, you do have the headquarters for the Ukrainian uh, Navy in this area, but they don't have that many, you know, actual military vessels anymore. A lot of those have been destroyed during the course of the war. So it is mainly for those uh, grain shipments. That's the main reason. There's also the worry that Ukraine has been using the grain corridor, the safe corridor, to transport and funnel weapons into Odessa. And this just provides them with a new lane to, uh, in a pretty safe manner, move supplies towards the southern part of Ukraine. And so now, if that was ever happening, it's going to be much more difficult for Ukraine to do that without a Russian response. There's also rumors, and I'm saying rumors because I can't confirm this, obviously, that Ukraine was utilizing the Grain Corridor, this safe zone that Russia was not able to hit, to launch their underwater drones that were going through the water. And that may have been why the Ukrainians were able to launch their drones so far deep into you know russian territory all the way to the crimean bridge without it being noticed because it was launched from an area that is closer to the crimean bridge still pretty far but is closer than odessa itself because the green corridor let's say it was over here you know that's you know 280 miles odessa if it was launched from odessa that would be about 400 miles which is pretty significant difference as you can see so all in all this is one of the most significant strikes that we have seen on a particular city. There have been many other waves of airstrikes that have occurred in the past, which have been way more significant on a broad scale across multiple cities, but on Odessa, it has been pretty significant. But let's move on to the situation with the United States Department of Defense, because they have announced a new package of military aid for Ukraine which comes in response to the Russians canceling the grain deal. So this is the second aid package in about nine, seven days, I'd say something like that. And so in this most recent round, it's worth $1.3 billion in aid, and it includes the Vampire Air Defense System. And this is a pretty small mobile system. It fires at a singular time for guided missiles. And it also includes a sensor package. It's mainly aimed at low altitude flying UAVs. And it could be mounted on a civilian truck. So that's why I'm saying it's very mobile and it doesn't require that much additional support equipment. There's also going to be Phoenix Ghost lawyering munitions that are sent to Ukraine. And also Switchblade drones. Now, I don't know whether this means that the Switchblade 300s are going to be sent to Ukraine or the Switchblade 600s. The 300s, those have been used pretty extensively by Ukraine throughout the entire war. They have suffered a lot from Russian jamming, which makes them way less effective. But they have still caused a certain amount of damage, especially when you can buy them in bulk. But Ukraine has been preferring to use their own drones, which they produce themselves, which are even cheaper than the Switchblades. And so I don't know how significant this shipment will be in and of itself. Switchblade 600s, those are more meant for piercing armor including, you know, artillery or, you know, armored vehicles. But I don't know how many of those are actually in production because they are a relatively recent invention. So the numbers, if they are being sent to Ukraine, will be relatively small, so they won't make a significant difference. The Department of Defense also announced that they'll be sending Australian drone shield anti-drone systems. 
and they'll be sending radar sensors and analytical systems. In addition to that, they will also be sending additional ammo, which probably includes shells, but also ammunition for small arms. So again, it's not anything significant. It's just more of the same, trying to resupply the Ukrainians in areas where they are suffering from shortages, and also trying to beef up their uh, drone defense systems against Russian drones, because that's become an acute issue for the Ukrainians due to the Russian uh, pervasiveness of their Lancet drones. So that is all understandable. Now let's move on to the front line, beginning with Zaporozhia. So starting off with Robotine, where we have seen significant fighting from both sides in recent days. Starting off the 65th Mechanized Brigade, a Ukrainian unit, they attacked directly to the north of Robotine. This is generally the direction of their attack, as you can see, coming from the north directly or from the northwest. Before we saw the Ukrainians attacking from the northeast in the Balk Uspanivska area, it seems like the Russians conducted a localized counterattack, and now the Ukrainians have shifted focus a bit more to the west. So far, I can't confirm any Ukrainian gains since the last time that they changed hands some of these fields. And so it looks like the 71st Motor Motorized Rifle Regiment, and specifically the 7th Company of that unit, which is the company which is really at the forefront of the vanguard of Russia's defense in this area. Let me see where the 71st is. I want to show their logo. So they've been able to hold the line. And at the same time, the Ukrainians are continuing to move in reinforcements to prevent a successful Russian defense in this area. So for instance, the 128th Mountain Assault Brigade, which is a unit which has previous combat experience, but they are now moving in some artillery. So their artillery battalion, the Cer Cerberus, that's the name of that battalion, that's the artillery battalion within the 28th Brigade. They have been moving in the self-propelled howitzers into Malatakmachka and into Novosilivka. And in terms of some of the most prevalent guns that they're moving in, it would be the 122mm 2S1 Gvozdika and the 152mm 2S3 Akatsia guns. So those are being moved to the front line to aid in the 65th Mechanized Brigade's assaults and the 47th Mechanized Brigade's assaults. Now, moving a bit to the east, we're going to be looking at the situation around Velika Novosilka. Starting off with Pryutnia, we talked before about Ukrainians nearing the northern outskirts of Pryutnia, and it seems like they're trying to continue doing that. They're trying to send in larger forces now in the dozens, so it's still pretty small, trying to send them into some of the key forest lines that are to the north of Pryutnia. So the front line has shifted a little bit to the south. I am still living a bit of a gray zone because no one side is in control of this one mile span of land. It is just open fields in that area, but the Ukrainians are taking up positions in the forested patch just to the north of those fields. You can see I'm zooming in on it, and that's in order to prepare for their eventual assault on Putin. And the unit doing this is the 501st separate battalion. I think that's of the 36th Brigade which is uh, this unit over here, Marine Brigade. Now, a bit to the east. The Ukrainians, they launch their own assault from the 35th Brigade, this unit over here, in the direction of Stormayorske. Stormayorske, I would say, is now contested. Before, I was saying that it was just rumors, but now, basically, every single side, both pro-Russia and pro-Ukraine, have agreed in unison that it is at the very least contested in the northwestern outskirts of the town. And so I'm not going to give Ukraine any sort of significant land within some of these houses because we don't know that for sure. But based on the maps that have been released from both sides, it does seem like the Ukrainians at least do have positions in some of the northmost outskirts with these warehouses and maybe in some of the northwestern warehouses. I don't know about the status of the town itself in the center. It seems like the Russians are trying to hold on to it for now. So we'll have to see if the Ukrainians are successful in their fighting in this area. Now, let's move on to the situation in Bakhmut. So let's begin with the situation around Klischivka. But actually, before that, I'm going to go to Marinka. because there's something very interesting that I want to talk about over there. So here's this local fortress. It's, in essence, this right now defunct mine, which was used by the Ukrainians before the war and it's now been turned into a local stronghold. And 
in this local stronghold, it basically gives you this domination, this field of vision across, you know, 360 degrees. You could see any sort of vehicle that is advancing towards you and they would have zero cover. So any sort of field that is adjacent to this fortress is really has been turned into a gray zone. So it's very important that either side have control over it for local domination. For the Ukrainian support in order to keep control over Krasna Horovka because the Russians would really find it difficult to send their own assaults through some of these roads directly to the south into Krasna Horovka due to the Ukrainian forward positions in this mine. So now we're receiving reports from Russian sources like Slavyanograd. They're saying that the Russians have been able to take over this fortress. And there was a video attached to it. I'll show that video here. And in that video, you can't actually see the Russians taking control over the mine. You can see them assaulting it, and you could also see a lot of smoke from artillery fire, which might be coming in from the Russian side or from the Ukrainian side. There's Ukrainian sources that are saying that the 79th Air Assault Brigade, which is located in Marika, was able to repulse the attack. So until we see, you know, Russian boots on the ground within this fortress, I can't say for sure whether or not they have control over the entirety of it. But if they did, then it would give them a very important local fortress that could allow for a further attack into Krasnohorovka. So here's just the video in its entirety. I'll let you guys see it. Here's a fortified area that's being hit. You can see and in the background, you can see Marinka, which is being contested at the moment. Now let's go back to the front line. Now going to the Bakhmut sector. In the area around Klyshivka, the Ukrainians have launched a new coordinated assault using the 5th Assault Regiment and the 3rd Separate Assault Brigade Azov. These are two units that have really a lot of experience with offensive activities, so it makes sense that they're the ones conducting these attacks. They've launched new attacks towards the heights that are just to the west of Klyshchivka, and they have had some success, as reported by even pro-Russia sources. The Rybar map that is depicting the situation around Klyshchivka actually shows the Russians and their lines all the way over here like this, and the Ukrainians right next to them. It doesn't really show much of a gray zone in this area, and so the implication would be that the Ukrainians have control over all of these heights over here that I'm going to mark in blue which is extremely significant because that would mean that the Russians have control of zero heights, zero trench systems, and that they would be all stuck in the valley within Klyshivka itself. I don't, I don't believe that myself personally. I haven't seen enough evidence. Rabar is the only source that I've seen that depicted the situation in that way, so I can't trust that. But I do know for the most part that the Russians have their strongest positions within some of these forested patches just to the west of Klyshivka, and that the area in between the trend systems that the Ukrainians control, like this one over here and this one over here, are a gray zone because, you know, it's just a field. You can't set up a position in an open field, not expect to be pounded by the opposition's artillery. But it does seem like the Ukrainians are actually going on the attack over here, and they have been able to make some gains around some of the trend systems that I talked about previously. So they have advanced in this direction, in this rectangle. They've taken land here, if they can land here, but I don't want to be uh, too, I don't want to exaggerate too much in terms of the Ukraine's gains in this area, so we're going to have to wait and see about the full extent. Another interesting thing about the Rybar map is that they show that the Russians have control over all of this area to the east of the Donbass Canal, and previously we heard that the Ukrainians were able to pierce this area, cross over the canal, and advance from the north into Kornimivka, but now Rybar is disputing this. I can't confirm that myself. I'm just going to keep it the way it is until we see, you know, additional reports from other sources. But it does seem like the Ukrainians are trying to fortify their positions just to the west of Kordimivka around some of the previous Russian fortifications in this area. And it would make sense for the Ukrainians to launch parallel, not parallel, sorry, but a two-pronged attack, one from the north, particularly the northwest, and then one from the east towards Kordimivka. Now, Let's go to the situation around Zvatove, which is very important right now. So we've been hearing now from the Ukrainian side, and I talked about this in my last video, that the Russians are going on the offensive here. If you want to hear more in depth about the details of this offensive and really the fact that it's not a new offensive and that this has been going on for a while, 
look at my previous video. But the thing is, Russians have generally conducted defensive activities on the entire Zvatovit front for about a month now. I have a video from a month ago talking about how they were making gains in Kupiansk. I have a video from more than a week ago now about how they were advancing towards Torske. So this entire talk about Russia launching this new offensive out of nowhere with 100,000 men, that is not really the case. If you break it down unit by unit, it looks more like 70,000 men. And they have been there for a while. It's not like Russia just sent those 70,000 in out of nowhere and just started launching this attack. So it's not really the same as the Zaporozhye counteroffensive in that regard. But yeah, generally Russia is launching these attacks, these offensive activities in these directions. And it does have localized results. We have seen results. And Ukraine is now on a more defensive posture, even in the forested area the Serebryansky forest where Ukraine has really been uh, notable for continuing to launch incessant attacks towards Zebrova. Now Ukraine is more on a defensive footing in this area. They are trying to fortify their defenses on the eastern side of the Zerbets River in the forested area. They're moving in more artillery into this area around Yampil as well, sending in more UAVs to protect the Ukrainian forces and attack advancing Russian forces. And again, doing the same thing around Torske and Yampolivka out of fear that Russia will take those towns that are adjacent to the Zerbets River and take over all of Ukraine's bridgehead, basically. The Ukrainians also moved in reinforcements, specifically the 121st Territorial Defense Brigade, which was previously located in Kherson. It's now stationed in Laman and will be sent to the front line at some point in the future. The Russians, they continue to expand their bridgehead across the Zerbets River, the western side which we talked about in yesterday's video. So here's the land that Russia took over in uh, yesterday's video, which is a bit to the south of Karmazhinivka. And this is all being done by the 21st Motorized Rifle Regiment, by the way. I have them on the map over here, as you can see. Or sorry, Brigade. So they're attacking from the south towards the Luhansk Kharkiv Oblast border. And today they also cross the river at a different point, which is directly to the west of Karmazhinivka. So here you can see the river. It's very narrow at this point, so it's not difficult to cross it over. You could do that in a small squad. And the Russians have taken over positions that are in the forested areas, which gives them some concealment. And you can see there's another forested patch over here, which I'm assuming the Russians are attacking at the moment. The Russians also are uh, having to face Ukrainian artillery, which is coming in from Makivka but nonetheless have been able to advance in this direction. So we'll have to see if Russia continues to advance in this direction, which could be an issue for Ukrainian concentrations in Makivka and Nevsky, which are pretty significant. But let's move on a bit to the north to the situation around Kupiansk, which is a bit ambiguous. So to the north of Kupiansk, it is being acknowledged by the Ukrainians that the Russians are on the attack over here. And this does seem to be the case, but Russian sources, they are saying that the Russians are making gains to the west of Liman Perishi. And this comes as a bit of a surprise to me because the area where they're alleging that the Russians are making gains is generally in this red square. The problem with this is that the Russians were supposed to be in control of this land about a month ago. I have videos that you could scroll to from a month ago, maybe more of the Russians taking over all these forested areas. This was pretty much acknowledged by a lot of Russian sources. And now those same Russian sources are saying that the Russians are taking it over again now, as if we went back in time a month. And I never saw them mention the Ukrainians counterattacking. So now I'm confused as to whether the Ukrainians did counterattack, but they never reported on it, or that those attacks by the Russians a month ago never happened. One of the two is correct. But for now, I'm going to be keeping the front line at what it is now because I haven't seen enough information to even validate that the Russians have uh, taken over those positions from the Ukrainians, because we don't even know if the Ukrainians have positions in those areas. Because from what I've been seeing, it seems like the Russian positions are a bit to the south, around the forested area to the west of Sinkivka. But regardless, regardless of the nitty-gritty details, we do know the overarching theme of the sector is that the Russians are on the attack, and we also see this given the fact that the Ukrainians are moving in reinforcements from the 14th Mechanized Brigade in order to hold the line to prevent a breakthrough into Kupiansk. 
let's go to the elevation map around Kupiansk. You can see that all these forested areas that the Russians and the Ukrainians are fighting over, those are all in very low elevated areas compared to Kupiansk especially. They're all basically the same elevation. So that's not an issue if the Russians take it over, which they may have already. If we go a bit to the east though, there are some very significant ridges that Russia does currently control. Let me show you the maps, you can cross-reference it. You can see here like Orleansk, for instance. Orleansk is located over here. That's an area where Russians have positions. So they have positions in that ridge. There are other ridges like over here where I'm having my you know, red lines marked, which are currently under Ukrainian control, but they are open fields. So there's not a significant Ukrainian presence in these areas. But if Russia were to attack towards these ridges and take them over, then they would have really a field day attacking the Ukrainian positions within Kupiansk and some of these other towns that are on the Oskia River. And that would make it very difficult for Ukraine to hold their positions on the eastern portion of the river. They'd have to withdraw to the western side of Kupiansk if that turned out to be the case. You see, see again, these are the ridges that I'm talking about in this area over here. The Ukraine has control over. So we're going to have to see how that plays out in the coming weeks if this offensive is actually legitimate. And so thank you guys so much for watching. And I'll see you guys again in the next video. Bye.